Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So it was about a year ago. Uh, it was a Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, and Lucy, our youngest, had come home from a birthday party and got her little party favor bag. And in that favor bag was a jump rope. And so over the next week, she was jump roping like crazy. And I was like pretty excited about that in that it's like, it's good exercise. It's like, yeah, good. Go jump rope. Go do that. That's great. Go get fit. All right. Trying to encourage her. Now, it didn't take long though from the jump roping to not only happen outside, but inside. And I had a different excitement level about jump roping happening inside. And I started to tell Lucy like, okay, you, you can't jump rope in the house. Like, that's not okay. It's not going to work. Because like, if you're swinging, you could hit somebody and it'll get hurt. You could knock something over. If you're in the kitchen and I'm cooking, you could hit me and I have something hot and burn myself. Not okay. And so over the next couple of days, she kept doing it. And I kept telling her like, you, you can't do this in the house. And so it was a Saturday evening, Saturday afternoon, and she's jump roping. I'm like, all right, you, you have to stop. If you do it again, this will be your consequence. I will cut your rope in half. And she gave me this look like, really? So I turned, I went back to what I was doing. I heard her jump again. And so I walked over with a pair of scissors. I took the jump rope and I snipped it. And this like look of shock and horror came over her face. Like he did it. Like he actually did it. I was like, yeah, I did. That's right. I'm your dad. And I do those sorts of things. But pretty quickly, like, that shock and horror faded, and she started to cry. Like, big, sobbing tears. And I had no remorse. No compassion. I'm like, I told you, if you were going to jump, I was going to cut the rope. You jumped, I cut the rope. That's how this works out. And she goes, but I didn't. I was like, no, I heard you. Like, I felt the vibration in the floor. I heard you. And she keeps pleading. No, I didn't. I didn't. And then Emma comes over and she's like, yeah, she didn't. I'm like, what are you saying? I heard and I felt. And they're like, she was just jumping. She was playing a joke on you. She wasn't actually swinging the rope. She was just jumping up and down. And in that moment, I felt horrible, horrible. And I start to console her. I like, sweetie, we'll get you a new jump rope. I can't believe you did that. And Emma's right there. And Emma goes, Dad, you're the worst. <laughs> and I was like, yes, sweetie. Yes, I am the worst. Now, in that moment, there was two things that, that were happening. Two things that I was experiencing. One, I was experiencing shame for what I did. And at the same time, I was experiencing condemnation. And oftentimes, we have like a little bit of confusion around what shame and condemnation is because oftentimes they get lumped together. But a real easy way to delineate between shame and condemnation is that shame is the feeling that you experience that comes with condemnation. And condemnation is a declaration or a proclamation, a negative one, a negative word that comes into your life and impacts your life. And in the same way that shame and guilt, shame and condemnation can get lumped together and there can be confusion about what they specifically are, guilt gets thrown into the mix and sometimes we just think shame, condemnation, and guilt are actually all the same. But it's helpful to have even a little bit more clarification around how guilt plays into the mix. So if shame is the feeling that you experience from condemnation, and condemnation is that negative word or declaration that comes into your light, guilt is the act of doing something wrong. So guilt pretty much says, I've done something wrong. I've broken a rule. I've broken a law. It's a state of being. You are guilty for what you have done. And so guilt is, I've done something wrong. But again, shame is a little bit deeper. It's a little bit more intense. And shame is about, I am wrong. Like there's something wrong with me. It's more of an identity, more of an understanding of who we are as an individual. Guilt is what I do, but shame is who 
I am. So in that moment where I cut the jump rope from Lucy, guilt was the act. I was guilty of doing that, but I wasn't really breaking any rule. But I felt shame because of what I did because there was this condemnation from Emma saying, Dad, you're the worst. And the reality is, like if you've been alive for more than a few years and have your wits about you, right? If you can actually like make sense of life, you are going to experience shame and guilt because it's a universal experience, right? Everybody at some point is going to experience shame and guilt. But guilt doesn't always have to be present in order to experience shame. Sometimes guilt gets thrown in the mix, but guilt doesn't always have to be present. There's a woman named Amy Tan, who is a New York Times bestselling author, and in the late 80s, early 90s, she wrote a book called The Joy Luck Club. And it hit number four, on the New York Times bestsellers list when she released it. And she always had this sense of trying to like please her mom, prove something to her mom, live up to her mom's expectations. And she was having a conversation with her mom about the release of her book and it hitting number four on the New York Times bestsellers list. And her mom comes back and says, well, what happened? Who's number three? Who's number two? Who's number one? And so even in her accomplishment, she said, I felt shame because of the condemnation of my mom essentially saying, you're not enough unless you're number one. And as we move from chapter 7 to chapter 8 in the book of Romans, like shame and condemnation are looming in the air. Because as you wind down chapter 7, Paul is in this wrestling match saying like, there's these things I know that I shouldn't do that I keep on doing, and there's this way that I should live that I know I should do, and I can't live up to that. And then he says in chapter 7, verse 24, he says, what a wretched man I am. Like, if, if that's not a declaration of shame, then I don't know what is. What a wretched man I am. And he goes on to say, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Now, there's a couple different sources of shame and condemnation that can come our way, meaning sometimes shame and condemnation are personal, meaning they come from one individual to another. Somebody makes a declaration, somebody says something about you, and you internalize what they say. So in the example of Amy Tan and her mom saying, what happened, who's number three, who's number two, who's number one, that's personal from one person to the next. Sometimes shame and condemnation come from an internal place in our own being. There's this voice in our head that keeps saying things about us and making declarations about us that we're not enough and we're never going to be able to measure up. But then sometimes it comes from a legal place, meaning there are rules, there are laws, and if you break those rules or laws, you are deemed guilty and shame and condemnation come your way. And so the question is, if shame and condemnation are universal realities, meaning we're all going to experience them at some point in our life, the question is, how do we fight against them when they surface? How do we battle it? How do we live in a different light? And if you're here this morning and you are currently in a shame struggle, then there is no more encouraging chapter in all of Romans, let alone the Bible, that is good news for you. This is how Paul begins chapter 8. He starts by saying, therefore, therefore. Now, therefore is a connecting word. It's a concluding word. Paul has been in this long section that started in chapter 5, that also started with a therefore, and is working its way through chapter 8. So, therefore is Paul's marker to say, I'm concluding and I'm wrapping up everything, and he's connecting what he's about to say with everything that has come before it. And if chapter 7 ends with this declaration, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me? He's leaving you at the end of chapter 7 with that question. Yeah, who will rescue me? But before he crosses into chapter 8, he he actually answers his own question. He says this in verse 25. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
And then Paul answers the question, right? Who will rescue you? Jesus Christ. But then he also leaves chapter 7 with this tension or this battle that sin still rages in our life. He says, so then I say to myself, in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law. Jesus has rescued me. I know that I should obey. But in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Sin still is at war within me, which means shame and condemnation still come my way. Chapter 8 begins with, therefore, Paul is going to speak to the tension of shame and condemnation that comes from sin, and he gives a declaration for those who are looking to Jesus but are still wrestling with sin, shame, and condemnation. He says, therefore, there is now. When? Now. Today. Therefore, there is now, today, in this moment, not tomorrow, not next week, not 10 years from now, not when Jesus comes back, there is now, right here, in this place today, what? No condemnation. There is no condemnation now, in this moment. And I wonder if there's anybody here this morning who needs to hear that. Is there anybody here this morning, in person or online, who needs to hear that now, in this moment, as you sit here, in this pew, in this room, there is no condemnation? So meaning, that thing that your coworker said to you or about you, that the reason your department or your team is tanking and lacking success is all because of you? Even if that is true, that doesn't define you. Like, that's, that's not who you are. There is no condemnation now. If you have this tape that plays over in your head, you'll never amount to anything. You're never going to be enough. You're never going to make it. That's not the truest thing about you. Because there is now, in this moment, right here today, no condemnation. If you're here this morning and you're feeling like an utter failure as a parent because your teenage child just got arrested and you had to go bail them out from the police department right now. In this moment, there is now no condemnation for you. Amen. Amen. There is no condemnation. That is the best news you could hear at any point in a world that is filled with condemnation and shame. The gospel says, no, 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 no. There is no condemnation. And you might be wondering, well, how? Like, how in, that, how in the world does that work? Because I feel shame and I feel condemnation all the time. Paul says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, this phrase, in Christ Jesus, is a wildly significant phrase for Paul. He will use it all over the place in the New Testament. It's one of Paul's common ways of talking about our connection to and our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you were raised in a church very similar to Meadowbrook Church, you might have grown up with this understanding that what we do when it comes to salvation is we ask Jesus into our life. We ask Jesus into my heart. Jesus comes into my life. Now, that's not necessarily wrong, right? Paul will say that in different places, that Jesus is in us, the Spirit is in us, but Paul's dominant way to talk about our connection with and our union with Christ isn't so much that Jesus is in me, but we are caught up in Him, right? We are caught up in His life. The implication being, therefore, the things that are true about Jesus are also true about us. Jesus is said to be the perfect spotless lamb who wipes away the sin of the world. And we are caught up in him. So therefore, in him, there is no condemnation. Amen? Yeah. So I grew up uh, in New England. I grew up in New Hampshire. And one of the things that's true about people in New England is that they love their sports teams. Love their sports teams. I guarantee you, the city of Boston is on fire today because they're playing the Bucks in game seven. Like the city, I'm sure, 
is going bonkers. But one of the most exciting sporting events in New England history happened in 2004. In 2004, the Red Sox won the World Series, which broke an 86-year drought of losing the World Series, or not getting to the World Series. And there was this thing known in Boston as the Curse of the Bambino. At one point in time, Babe Ruth played for the Boston Red Sox. The Boston Red Sox were unstoppable in the early years of the league. When the World Series first became a thing, the Red Sox won five out of the first 13 or 15 World Series. That's 30%. That's a lot of World Series, right? Then they traded Babe Ruth, and ever since, they could never win the World Series. So there's always this monkey on their back. But in 2004, they got the monkey off their back. They won the World Series. And actually, the World Series, if you are a baseball fan, wasn't all that exciting. It was the series leading up to the World Series where they played the Yankees. That was off the chain. They were down three games to none. And then they climbed back one after another after another and destroyed the Yankees, went into the World Series, and won. Now, I was a grad student at that time. In 2004, I was a grad student at uh, Trinity. And everybody knew that I was from New England. There wasn't too many New England people there. And when the World Series was happening in October, like people were talking to me about it all the time. When they were climbing back from being three down, three games down against the Yankees, they're like, are they going to do it? Is this going to be another thing? And then once they won the World Series, I can't tell you how many classmates came up to me and congratulated me. <laughs> they congratulated me. They said, hey, man, congratulations. You won. I, I hated to tell them, like, no, I, I didn't win anything. Like, I might be from New England, but nowhere along the way was Terry Francona, the manager of that time, calling me up, asking my advice about how to navigate the series. Like, nobody out there was consulting me in any way. I had nothing to do with their win. But yet, around campus, I received congratulations and accolations as though I did win. And so what was happening in that moment, like I was caught up in their success. The success that they had was projected onto me. I was essentially, you could say, in the Red Sox, right? Like I was part of the organization receiving their victory. It's the same for us in Jesus. We are caught up in Jesus. And therefore, the things that are true about him are true about us. The victory that he has, the love that the Father gives to him, the success that he has in living a perfect life is also projected onto us. And here's what comes our way when we are found to be caught up in Jesus. This is verse 2. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Being in Jesus means there is no condemnation. Right here, right now, today, no condemnation spoken over your life. No matter what somebody says, you can say, I don't receive that. And that's not true of me. What's true of me is what's true of Jesus. And what Jesus brings is freedom. He breaks the power of sin and death in your life. Now, it's important to define freedom because biblical freedom and cultural freedom are two very different things, right? Cultural freedom is seen as we have no limits on us, no boundaries. Nothing can constrain us. Nothing can block us in. We are unhindered people. And you see it all the time in cultural artifacts like advertising. Like in this picture, it says cherish freedom, right? It's for a company called MacPack, which kind of um, creates outdoor gear, and so you see there the image of this person sitting in their tent, what's on the edge of a lake. There are no boundaries. I can go wherever I want, camp wherever I want. I can live unencumbered lives and do whatever I want. So we cherish this freedom of being unhindered and going wherever and living wherever. Nothing can block us in. But biblical freedom isn't so much about living an unhindered life but rather it's living into the design for which God has for you. And a great example of this is a fish, right? A fish has a natural boundary. That natural boundary is the water. 
If it goes outside that boundary and tries to live and tries to walk up on shore and live life on the beach, what will happen? The fish will die. Because the fish wasn't created for the land. The fish was created for the water. And when it lives into its design and it embraces the limits and the boundaries that it has around it, it can cut through the water, it can slice and die. It becomes a beautiful thing to watch a fish swim in a place where it's doing the thing it was created to do. So biblical freedom isn't so much about living an unhindered life, going wherever and doing whatever. Rather, it's about embracing the boundaries that God has set for you so that you can become the person that God has designed you to be. And when you do that, what you experience is life. Life. He says, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life, has set you free. But it requires that you live in such a way that you embrace the natural limits that God has set for you, and you live into the design that God has created for you. Now, what Paul is doing here in these first few verses in chapter 8 is he's connecting the notion of freedom to law. He's been talking about law a ton, especially in chapter 7. And at the beginning, we said that the source of shame and condemnation in your life could be personal, from one person to the next. It could be internal. You have this tape playing in your head. It can also be legal, meaning there are certain laws, rules, commands against which our life is measured to see if we are guilty. And when we are, sometimes shame comes in. And one of the main metaphors in the book of Romans is that of a courtroom. A courtroom kind of sets the stage. It's somewhat of the backdrop. Paul uses judicial language all over the place through Romans, right? Words like judgment, justice, justification, condemnation, righteousness. Commentators say all the time that Paul uses judicial language to describe how God redeems us and set us free. So the image of Romans in some ways, in part, is that you are in a divine courtroom that someday everybody will stand before the judge and have to give an account of the way that we lived our lives. And in a courtroom, the thing that is front and center is the law. And we are judged against the law, whether or not we have upheld the law or whether or not we have broken the law. And if you break the law, the reality is guilt and therefore condemnation, do come your way. And the reality is that we are all lawbreakers. Every one of us. We have all at some point, somewhere along the way, transgressed the law of God. So not this past week, but the week before, I had a really full week Uh, It was at the end of May 1st service that Sunday. I left to go up north to go to a pastor's retreat for a couple of days, came home Wednesday night, and then I flew out to California for a few days of meetings with churches and church leaders, about 25, 30 of us from all over the country, asking the question, what does it mean for churches like Meadowbrook Church to become a reproducing church and continue to further the kingdom of God by starting new churches? And While pastor gatherings can be great, they're also some of the most insecure gatherings you will ever attend. A pastor can stand up on stage and communicate to a few hundred people and appear really confident and put together. You put that same pastor in another room filled with other pastors, all of a sudden he becomes incredibly insecure. Your pastor is also one of those people. Because what happens when you're in a room with other pastors, you naturally start to compare. You naturally start to measure yourself against other people and the other pastors, and you're like, am I a better pastor than they are? Do do I have a bigger church than they do? Are we more successful than they are? Is our budget bigger than them? And then once you find out Uh, the info, right? Because sometimes it just comes out in conversation. Sometimes pastors are so insecure, they will just ask you right out, how big is your church, right? Trying to compare themselves to you. But as that info starts to come out, if you find that they are more successful than you and the metrics that, you know, Americanized society measures things, what you do next is you criticize them. 
Well, it's probably because they're using unspiritual means to grow their church or whatever, right? <laughs> but deep down inside, <clears throat> what's happening is you're coveting whatever they have, whether it's this beautiful new building they just built or this huge church that they have or this slick technology that you use. And if I'm honest, being at a pastor's retreat and then being at a gathering of pastors to talk about starting new churches, like that was a battle within me. <clears throat> and at times, I found myself coveting and criticizing and not loving the other people that I'm with, when the reality is we're all on the same team. We're all in it together. We're all trying to create disciples, to further the kingdom, to bear witness to the love of God in the world. But yet, I find idolatry in my heart because I want to compare, criticize, and I covet what they have. When I look at my life, when I'm honest about my life against the law, I find real quickly, I break the law. I transgress the law of God because idolatry has taken root in my heart. Which leaves us with the question, well, how can I be free? And how am I not condemned if I've broken the law? If I live in that place of continual wrestle, continued tension, and I break the law. This is what Paul says in verse 3. He says, for what the law was powerless to do. What the law was powerless to do. It's important to note that many of us here this morning are trying to gain freedom in life from following the law. Many of us are living into that reality where we think if I can follow the law good enough, strong enough, faithful enough, then yes, I will experience freedom in life. But all we're experiencing is guilt, shame, and condemnation. And so we ramp it up even more. I'm going to try harder. And then we experience more guilt, more shame, more condemnation, because the law was never meant to rescue. The law was never meant to give you everlasting life. Paul says that in verse 20 of chapter 5. He says, the law was brought in so that trespass and sin might increase. The law was there to show you your need, not rescue you or save you. And so many of us are trying really, really hard to keep the law in hopes of finding freedom in life. Now, what's interesting about the way that Paul uses the term law throughout Romans is that he uses it in different ways. Sometimes he uses the word law to refer to the entire Old Testament. The law and the prophets, you'll hear him say from time to time. Sometimes he uses the word law to reference the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's where you find the, prime, the, uh, um, the majority of the Old Testament law in those five books. And then sometimes he uses it just to describe various laws in general. So when you're reading Paul and you're reading Romans, you have to understand which way is Paul using the word law when he uses it. And in Romans 8, 1 through 4, he uses it in a, in a few different ways. And I'm going to guess many of us here this morning aren't trying to find life and freedom from following the Old Testament law, right? If you've ever read through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There's so many obscure laws there that are just not applicable to our life because we live in a very different context. But many of us are trying really hard to uphold some version of religious or spiritual law that maybe even we've created to think that if I'm living up to this law, then I know that I'm okay with God. M many of us have this version of what it means to be a good Christian in our minds. And we think, if I live up to that thing, then I'll be okay. I'll be free and have life. But for some of us, it's not so much this version of living into this life of being a good Christian. For some of us, we have this law around productivity in our life. Like, I've got to be productive all the time. I've got to be accomplishing something all the time. I've got to be moving the needle forward because if I'm not, then I'm a slacker and then I won't be seen to not be enough. So after a week of travel up north for a pastor's retreat and going to California and getting home at like one in the morning on Saturday, going into this past week, I was tired. 
I have a couch in my office. And one afternoon, I was like, you know, I was reading a book, studying. I'm just going to go lay down on the couch and put my feet up and keep reading. It didn't take but like two minutes before like my eyes started to roll back into my head. And like the book is like now on my chest. And then like I wake up and I'm like, oh, did anybody come in or peek into my window? Like I, like I don't want anybody seeing me sleeping in my office. Not that I take naps all that often. <laughs> but meaning like there's this law that I have in my head, like productivity is king. And if I'm not producing, I'm a nobody, right? Some of us live with the law of productivity and we measure ourselves against whether or not we're productive. Some of us, it's being right. Like we have to be right all the time. And you have to let everybody else in your life know that you are right all the time. And so you go around correcting everybody all the time. And then you wonder, why don't I have any friends, right? Because <laughs> nobody wants to be around you because all you do is try and prove your rightness. And so rightness becomes a law for you that you measure yourself against. And if I'm wrong, shame and condemnation comes in. It, even for me in this moment, preaching, like preaching becomes one of those things. If I have a sermon that I don't feel is up to my standards, I walk out into the lobby and it's just like, oh, that was awful. Shame and condemnation can come in. But Paul is saying, for what the law, whatever your law is, whether it's spiritual law, being a good Christian, productivity, or always being right, the law was powerless to do what you think it will do for you because it was weakened by the flesh. The law can't do it. You don't have the ability. He said, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. God did. And he did it. By sending his own son, he says, in the likeness of sinful flesh. The law was never meant to be your salvation. It was never meant to be your source of life. God did what the law couldn't do by sending Jesus. He said, in the likeness of sinful flesh, which is Paul's way of saying in human form, to be a sin offering. All throughout the Old Testament, offering sacrifices to manage your relationship with God was a normal part of the Israelites' experience. But it says in Hebrews that Jesus came being the final sacrifice, the last sacrifice once and for all. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. Paul says in Colossians 2 verse 14 that God, when Jesus died on the Christ, canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He wiped it away. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And then he goes on to say in verse 4 here in chapter 8, in order that, like here is the purpose. In order that is a purpose clause. It's a purpose statement. This is what he was trying to achieve and accomplish through his debt, that the righteous requirements of the law might be met in us who do not live according to the flesh, meaning the sin, according to sin, but according to the Spirit. Have you ever thought or wondered what the righteous requirements of the law is? What were the righteous requirements of the law that Jesus met through his death on the cross? Was it holiness? Was it perfection? Was it doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves? In part, yes, yes, and yes. But the thing that is most clearly demonstrated on the cross that Jesus does when he dies is show us the love of God. The righteous requirement of the law is love. Jesus sums that up, Matthew 22. He takes all 613 commands in the Old Testament and he says all of those 613 commands can be summed up in two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love one another as yourself. All the law, all the prophets hang on those two things. And what Paul is saying is that through Jesus' death on the cross, what's true of him is true of us. We are caught up in him, and so therefore the righteous requirements of the law are met by us, even though at times we're not always loving people. Because what Jesus came to do was not abolish the law, but he says in Matthew 5, he came to fulfill the law. He came to fulfill the law through loving the world so that we might be caught up in his love so that we have the ability and the power 
to pass along his love to other people. What the law was powerless to do, Jesus did through his death on the cross, fulfilling the righteous requirements of the law that we might become people of love. And so here's what Paul is saying. If we were to boil it down to this, it's when condemnation weighs you down, it's the love of God that sets you free. When condemnation weighs you down and burdens you and is turning over in your head like a tape, it is the love of God that sets you free. And so when condemnation does come your way, the challenge is to counteract it with the love of God. Which means we have to ask the question, who here is struggling with shame and condemnation this morning? Who here has received some sort of word or declaration into their life that has sent you on a tailspin <clears throat> over the last few days around your identity and who you are and that you're not enough? Who here has a tape playing over in their head repeatedly that you're never going to measure up? Who here is, is noticing that your life yeah, isn't in line with the way that God desires you to live? Here's how I want us to end this morning. I want us to end with just sitting for a minute and closing our eyes and naming where that condemnation is for you. Naming where that sin and that shame is for you. And if you're finding that it's other people who are saying something about you, a simple prayer for you this morning is, they don't own me. And you can say that to yourself right now. They don't own me. Their words in my life aren't the truest thing about me. There is no condemnation. And if it's yourself where you're finding that you have this continual cycle of things in your head that says you're not enough, you're not good enough, you'll never measure up. This morning you should say to yourself, I'm going to break that tape with Romans 8.1 that there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. And if you are living in a place where you aren't living into the thing and the design for which God has created you for, the response is to repent to say, God, I, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to agree with you about who I am and what I was created for. As I leave this place, I'm going to cling to that identity. Those are the things that are true about me. And what happens, you can open your eyes if you're still closing them. What happens is that when you live into that space, when you live into those things in that way, and you say, I'm bringing the love of God to bear on my heart, it begins to change you. It begins to change who you are. And then the love of God can then flow through you. You know, so one of the things that's true of my wife and I, she's a therapist, me being a pastor, we often sit with people who are in really difficult places in life. Sometimes their places in life are so hard, so difficult, we come home at the end of the day and we're like, we can't fix them, right? We can't help them. And that's not actually our job to fix people. And she had one of those conversations with a client this week. She's like, I don't know what I'm doing with this client. I had one of those conversations with a friend this week where I'm like, his life is so far beyond repair from simplistic advice that I can give. And so I was thinking this week, what, what does that mean for us? Like as people who like try and help people grow in their walk with the Lord, how do we help them when we can't? And the thing that Romans 1, or Romans 8 made me think of was, it's not about the advice I give. It, it's not about trying to fix them. It's about who I am with them, meaning that I can sit with them in their shame, in their guilt, and not condemn them. When I'm stuck in that place, where I'm like, I can't help them. I can't fix them. The best thing I can do is not condemn them and just simply love them and be present with them because that's what Jesus has done for us. He has come into the darkest places of our life to say, I'm here and I love you. And when that happens for you, your life starts to change, and you start to look more and more like Jesus. 
So may you see that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. May you see that there is a new law, the law of the Spirit that is at work in you, and may you find that through the Spirit, it is the love of God that sets you free. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the reality of the gospel, that it is good news, and that we are people who are not condemned, that we are people who live free of shame and guilt. And Lord, sometimes it is so hard to believe. Sometimes it is so hard to appropriate that reality to our lives. And so, Lord, we ask this morning that for those of us here today who are struggling with shame and condemnation, that we would find freedom in your love, that they would see that it's your love displayed through Jesus Christ that makes us new every day, and that we might find that you are continually faithful to us, and that you do for us what we can't do for ourselves. We love you and we pray this.